Mr. Pond Boss. Here we go. Tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. What do you think about that little song right there? Isn't that a good one? Isn't that little ditty? <laughs> Hello, everybody. Bob Lust, the Pond Boss, coming at you live from a secret hideaway somewhere west of Lake City, Florida. We'll leave it there, right? That's a good estimate. Is that a good estimate? Yeah. Hanging out with Dr. Howard Dittrick from starting off in Iowa, San Diego. Got a piece of property here, a couple pieces of property with some really cool lakes, and we've been working on his lakes today. We, uh, I guess we electrofished four of them. Mm. Are you sore? I'm sore. <laughs> I'm sore. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that. Now, you guys know how to play the game. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comments section. Click like. Share this video to your timeline, and you're eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat. There it is right there, and a Pond Boss mug that, say it with me, Jacob, knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. We don't know how it knows, but it knows. So uh, we had a big day today. We did. Holy cow. You know, and, and, and the, the fun thing is when, when we go analyze ponds and lakes, used to I would have expectations, but nowadays I don't. So... Uh, it's a good thing that I didn't have any expectations because you never know what's going to roll up in front of those electrodes. So uh, I'm going to click this on here. Got the voices off. Look at that. We already got a pretty good crowd. We got 22 people watching. There's Danny Mack checking in from San Antonio. Billy Bates from Maryland. Kim Moore. I can think Kim's from Iowa if I remember. Troy Todd. John Funk from Michigan. Michael Gray from Nashville, Tennessee. Michael Gray is is uh, one of the premier lake builders in the industry. And he works south of Nashville. That's where I am. He happened to have a piece of property south yeah, of Nashville. You guys need to connect up one of these yeah. days. Rover. Rover. <laughs> Rover. Rover, Tennessee. Todd Austin. Hey, Wyatt. There's Wyatt checking in. He's got property there in uh, uh, near Abilene, Texas. He's hanging out in Denver, Colorado, or maybe not. Drew Hay, pond builder from Pennsylvania. Glad you guys are all joining in here. Make sure I hadn't missed anybody yet, which I don't think we have. Here's Jared Poole. Jared Poole. Hammer time. If you want to go fishing, go with Jared Poole. That guy knows how to play the game. Let's see what we got here. No ice on that. You know what? The only ice you will see here is in a glass of tea or water right there. There's the only ice you'll see. <clears throat> Todd Austin is saying, are you from Iowa? I am. There you Amana, go. Iowa. Amana, Iowa. There's a whirlpool factory there, and it started off Amana. I mean, there you, some of the stuff you're... Tell us a little bit about Amana, Iowa. Pretty dead gum interesting. It's an unusual place. A little German community. Seven villages on 25,000 acres. It is where Amana Refrigeration started, which was then owned by Maytag and now by Whirlpool, but the factory's still there. My dad worked there for 51 years. 51, 51 years. years, wow. And you decided to follow in his footsteps and went to medical school and became a cardiologist. Yeah. yeah I love right. that. It's just there like appliances, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Bill Russell, good to see you. Doug Cusick, yep. Oh, Kim, yeah, that's right. Kim's from Central Illinois, I knew that. Lance Pierce saw from Guthrie, Oklahoma. Yeah, John, you're making fun of us here. T, right. Todd Austin from Marshalltown. Fred Bingaman from Illinois is checking in. <clears throat> well, let's talk a little bit about what we did today. We started off electrofishing a pond that's a little more than a tenth of an acre. And I swear, last night was Christmas Eve. <laughs> today was Christmas. He could not wait to open the packages. And we got out in that boat. And what happened? Well, yeah, it did. I did. I thought Christmas was coming today, but I also thought, uh, you know, it was going to be one of those crab hauls in the in the dangerous catch, you know, and we and we'd have it spilling out over. But it wasn't exactly that, so I had to get used to what you can expect to get. It was, in, but it did explain why things that we aren't catching as many fish out there right now. Yeah. So you were disappointed. You're trying to not say that, so I'm going to say it for you. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So when we got out there, um, we, we, we were, one of the one of the problems was the catch rates had dropped for whatever reason, and you caught several really big bass, and you've seen some big bass out there. So it doesn't take long to electrofish a .14 acre pond, 
and shocked up 11 bass. Missed one that I know was over five. I saw it. And uh, uh, several saw several hundred young of the year bluegills and then several really good eight and a half, seven and a half to eight and a half, some couple, now one 10 inch bluegill. So the bluegills look pretty good. So you've got an aeration system. You've got a well spitting water into it to keep the keep the level up. Uh, you've got a feeder feeding MVP, right? MVP. Yeah, I get to see <coughs> Bob's picture on the package every time. I... Do you read the instructions? No, no, sir. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to. Well, um, yeah, let me kind of defend myself a little bit on that deal. <laughs> when we were talking about when they were going to improve the uh, Aquamax lineup of feeds, Purina, they wanted me to help write the instructions. So one of the head guys showed up at our house at LL comma two back then, and we started talking about it. So I started writing some instructions and my bride, Queen Debbie was listening and she said, hey boys, and there were two of them. She said, boys, his picture needs to be on the back of that fish food bag. And the lead guy said, eh, well, well, maybe. No, she said, no, you're not listening to me. His picture needs to be on the back of that bag. Well, she cajoled him, convinced him, and uh, coerced him into it. So everybody else gets their picture at the post office. Mine's on a feed sack. <laughs> you look good on it, too. <laughs> hey, there's David. He's Naderman. <clears throat> David's checking in from the Metroplex. He's the Easy Dock of Texas guy, one of the sponsors of the show. <clears throat> Todd Austin. Mike Cottrell from Palapena County. Hey, I'm headed to Palapena County. Actually, I'm going to go work on a lake near Possum Kingdom Lake on Monday. Lance Pearsall, could you talk a bit about the well he has putting water into his pond? I'm in the process of trying to do that right now on my pond. So tell us about your, your well. Well, when I bought the property a year ago, the pond was there. This is 60 acres with uh, pine forest in it, but in the middle of it, he's got a pond and a feeder there because his wife liked to hunt and fish. So he transformed the, while the pines were growing into that. And he put a well in early and he just actually it runs about, what is it, 350 feet from the well to that. And we're running, we actually added a two inch line. It was uh, putting one inch water in there, but we added another so we could really fill it if it ever got dry. Doesn't get that dry here in Florida. Well, the well, yeah, it rains here. <laughs> it rains here just a bit, yeah. Just a little bit. So uh, I was kind of looking at that well, and it looks to me like it's cranking out probably 30 to 40 gallons per minute. Yeah, with Is just it, the one. With the going, one inch, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so it, it's got, it's discharging some pretty good amount of water. And one of the big problems here that they have to deal with is aquatic plants. So we'll talk a little bit more about what's out here behind us, right out here, but uh, dealing with a, with runaway aquatic plants because with, with a long growing season for plants, plenty of nutrients, a lot of rain, plants have an advantage and they can really rock and roll. Lance is asking, electric well or solar? It's electric. It's electric. So they've got electricity up to a certain point and then they just they have the well, which was here when you bought the place, and then they just piped water to the pond. So was part of the plan was that well to uh, to irrigate trees or for a homestead or what? You know, he inherited it from his dad. He planted pines. We saw last night, remember, there's a yeah, second we looked at crop. Google Earth. Yeah, second mm -hmm. crop of pines. And he just hunted it. I'm the one who, we put a trailer on it and put some more 50 amp hookup for the trailer on it. but. It was never meant to do more than deliver water to that pond. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So there it is. So they drilled it in the most convenient place, then piped it where it needed to go. And so it's electric. And do you have it on a timer or you just somebody turns it on and off? We have to turn it on and off. And then, of course, the well runs when the pressure drops. And the water chemistry is really good. And just what it, Lance is asking about, what's the electric bill, do you know? Oh, I don't. I, well, I it's probably forty dollars a month down 40 here. Forty bucks a month, same as one bag of fish food plus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or a, a night out to dinner. Yeah, <laughs> cheaper than a Friday night date to run a well for a month. I love that. That's a good perspective. Well, who who'd have thought of that, right? <laughs> okay, so we worked on that lake, and then after we started. Uh, 
analyzing the data, we, we decided we'd talk about it. And we decided that, uh, and, and Howard said, you know what, why, why can't we just make that a bluegill pond? Well, yeah, Captain Obvious here. I, why didn't I think of that? I'm the fish guy. And so we talked about that. So what he's going to do, he's going to ramp up the fish food and keep the bass a little crowded we estimated there to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 largemouth bass in there. The majority of them are 9 to 14 inches maybe, and with two or three, maybe four that are substantially larger. But there can't be any more than that, or we wouldn't have seen the numbers of small bass that we saw. So I'm going to try to see if we can't grow some uh, really significant bluegills. And the bluegills you've got look like they were about three years old to me, in eight and a half, eight and a quarter, ten 10 inches. So we shocked up, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 11 bluegills. Here's the, here's the data sheet. Y'all wondering what we're looking at. There's the data sheet. So we, every time, and we were with American Sport Fish Hatchery, Robbie Mays came down from Montgomery, Alabama. <clears throat> and so uh, we've got these notes that we take and we log every fish that we weigh. We don't weigh all of them, but we measure all of them. So, uh, that's what we did. Then after that, we came over here about 15, 20 miles away to an old rock quarry where they quarried uh, dolomite, lime. Limestone. Limestone. Yeah. And over the years, well, they would leave the overburden and move it around, and there'd be a hole here and a hole there, and you ended up with about four different lakes that are, that are different sizes, ranging from maybe three acres <coughs> up to 13 or 14 acres. And well, and the fourth one, the is commonly held as 40 acres. We didn't, yep. uh, yeah, we didn't look we at that. We decided not to shock somebody else's fish today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, there's Drew Bachman checking in from South Carolina. Good to see Drew. Um, and so we went to the one you call, oh, well, we can't say the name, but we could call it the Round Lake. So we went to the Round Lake first, and now you've got, uh, I'll describe this. These lakes are, if we were if we we're up north, we'd call them eutrophic. But here, the water's crystal clear. You can see 20 feet deep. And a lot of that's got to do with the water chemistry. But peripherally, lots of reeds, <coughs> lots of uh, cattails, lots of uh, little floating islands that are just pretty darn cool. But you, you, you got to seeing that there were so many cattails that they interfered with access accessing the lake. So he brought in a helicopter and took out a bunch of the cattails with a herbicide. And the other nemesis was they had a whole bunch of coontail. So the coontail was getting out of hand. So now tell us a little bit about each one of these lakes. And then let's talk about what we found. I mean, you had expectations, which expectations didn't get met. However, the truth did. So <laughs> kind of take us through each one of these lakes and what it means to you and a little bit about the fishery and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. The round lake is the smallest of them. It's real dark, but it had become completely overrun with coontail. And so, um, with some fear last fall or, uh, maybe four months ago, five months ago, we, uh, put in a gallon of, um, now I'm going to forget the name of it. Wipeout. A gallon of wipeout. Okay. The one that inhibits photosynthesis completely, but shouldn't harm any any animals. Okay. Left it behind, and it was amazing. First of all, they killed all the bonnets, and that's why we have some of those floating islands. They're actually formed from the tubers that came out of those bonnets, or from the bonnets. But the coon tail completely disappeared. It was amazing. Now it's connected to the other, uh, the next lake over, House Lake. And so some of those bonnets disappeared as well. Uh, but that gave us access, because we could hardly fish that anymore. It was so, the vegetation was so dense. Mm -hmm. So so you clean that up and then what happened to your catch rates? Did it help? It helped access, but did it help you catch more fish? Um, well, it's been quiet lately just because of the colder weather, I okay. think, some of it. But I, I was surprised I wasn't catching them there because I certainly had access. So, so we brought in the, the, the final answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, there's John Pearson, Western Kentucky. And 
Greg Nugent from Central Kentucky. <coughs> all aquatic, all aquatics are giving us a wave. Tom Davis is here from Ohio. Billy Bates says, Bob, I know in general bottom aeration is best, but in a pond that's five acres with a maximum depth of seven feet, I've seen how many are diffusers that would require, and it seems impractical. I don't really want fountains unless you say otherwise, but I know they're generally visual pleasure versus really moving water. What's the best option, aerator? Do you just ditch the idea completely? I want aeration, just can't figure out the best option. I'll tell you what I would look at. I would look at circulators. If you find the right size circulator, you can create a current that's a horizontal current. Now, what you won't do with a horizontal circulator is you won't do away with your um, thermocline in the summertime. And most folks that want to have aeration in the summertime are trying to, to uh, at least push the thermocline down a little bit. So each one of these aeration systems has its own purpose. Circulators are designed to create a current and move the water circular. Bottom diffusers, picking up water off the bottom, pushing it to the surface to communicate with the atmosphere. Fountains, they're more to look good because they don't draft deep enough to be significant for aeration. You get into the Mississippi Delta, they've got these de devices that are paddle wheels that make a huge amount of noise, stir the water up, and they'll inject oxygen from the atmosphere immediately. But they're really turbulent. They're also creating a current. So the, uh, the thing about bottom diffusers, it's each one of the companies out there will design one specifically for your lake. You know, for a seven acre lake, they'd probably want two compressors with at least six different uh, diffusers, you know, and that's probably going to be six thousand dollars, depending on how. The biggest cost is the uh, <coughs> is the weighted tubing. That's the biggest cost. There's Matt Marsden checking in. He's American Fish Tree from Tennessee, so he hangs out. He's, he uh, builds fish structures and advertises in Pond Boss uh, very often. So. Now, as we as we as, as we went around the house lake, that lake, how big is that lake? What did we say? Eight, eight acres. Okay, and the, before we get into what we found, tell everybody the phenomenon you saw not that long ago, and let's talk about that because that's something that is really really interesting with the bass lining up that you saw. Oh, yeah. So we had cleared through that the helicopter spray. A lot of cattails went down, and we also got uh, for the tractor one of these lane sharks. So we cleared a lot of the uh, brush along the side because the, all the lakes had been sort of taken over from the ground and from the water with cattail and reeds. So one day we were standing there, and we were near the spring of House Lake. And it was crystal clear. It's always crystal clear, but the sun was just right. And we stood there and watched in pure amazement as about 30 bass, all about 22 inches in length, almost identical in size, moved across our view in formation, like an armada. There had to be 30 of them, maybe 40 feet across and that long. Now we were fishing at the time, nobody took any bait, nothing. They were just moving in almost a synchronized, like, like an armada, it really was that. That's, and so now I wish, I wish we could hear you guys talk because I would want you to talk amongst yourselves and figure out what was going on. Um, my opinion is that fish do that when there's a stressor and they're trying to get away from that, whether it's temperature or Oxygen levels have plummeted, or there's a, a plankton bloom has crashed, or something else that's going on that drives them away from where they like to stay, and then they and they headed right for that spring and lined up facing the spring. So there was a current in that underwater spring. The water was fresh, although it probably wasn't oxygenated very well. So we know they weren't really looking for more oxygen. <coughs> So they were getting away from something, you know, like a like like hot weather, or there was something that distressed them enough that they that they instinctively moved away from it to go to somewhere that was safer. And how long did they stay there? We saw them for 10, 15 minutes. And then did they dissipate? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So they came in, got freshened, whatever. 
they need it. And, and I see that pretty often with ponds that are static. You get a rainfall, water's flowing in, fish will flock to that incoming water. Now, typically in that circumstance, instinctively they're, they're, um, they're believing that there's going to be a food source. So they go up into that moving water. Like if they're shad, shad are going to go to that moving water. If they're shiners, they're going to go to that moving water. And so when that's going on after a rain, then they're going to come to that. Dave Weber's got a pretty tricky question here. Dave's so but that means that they weren't coming by me, the owner and premier, like they would the Korean leader. It was and not. It, it, was, it was not. not it was not a Howard parade. No. Shut. <laughs> Shut. It was. Hey, uh, <laughs> something ain't right over here. We're coming over there. All right, so Dave Weber from outside of Kansas, northeast of Kansas City says, by using Wipeout, how are you able to eliminate all the coontail in one treatment without getting an oxygen depletion fish kill? <coughs> well, so, I can tell you I've never seen a carcass on any of these lakes. Yeah, what? and and when we looked at the fishery, it didn't, you know, you can look at a fishery and see that there was a fish kill, even if you don't observe the fish kill because of the way that the remaining fish respond. And they respond by reproducing, or they respond by being ill, you know, having sores on them. They respond by um, uh, their numbers are lower than they should be. And we didn't see any of that. But I'm gonna give you my answer. When, when you put that wipeout out, how did you put it out? Did you put it out and just pour it in the water? Uh, Bud took it out in a boat and t distributed it across. That. I'm going to tell you what I think happened. I think that 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 uh, its half life is long enough as a contact killer that it was able to to migrate through drift over a series of days. I don't think it killed all the plants in one day. I think it killed those right there, and then as as the water moved it out and and dispersed it, they got lucky. And it all didn't die at one time. And, and it's, it's, still, it's still dying and it's still decomposing. So that happened over a long period of time. And when did you do that? Three months ago. And it okay. didn't manifest for more than a month. So change in color, because the plants turn white, don't they? Mm -hmm. Or lighten as they lose green color. Mm -hmm. That took a while. Yep. Remember, it's connected to House Lake too. So there's... 12 acres of water. Yeah. Yeah. So it just, it just didn't all happen once at once. Greg Nugent, hear a lot about water temperature when dealing with ponds, lakes, fish activity, vegetation, and so on when talking about water temps. At what depth is the temp measured? One specific depth or multiple depths? I'm going to tell you that that's based on your goals. Now, if you, if you're wanting to uh, find the thermocline in the summer, it's a good idea to check it at different depths. Uh, and actually, when you've got extreme temperatures, whether it's hot or cold, I like to do that anyway and measure it, depending on the depth of the lake, either one foot increments or three foot increments. <clears throat> so if the water is 20 feet deep, I like it in three foot increments. If it's eight feet deep, I like it in one foot increments so you can really find where that thermocline is. Danny Mack. Danny Mack is one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. He said, I would guess that Florida groundwater is fairly oxygenated, not very old rainwater. That's probably right because these springs are coming through fractures of, uh, of limestone here. And it was, we, we took a, he took me on a quick tour of the mine yesterday that's still harvesting. And you could see some of the rock was pretty hard. Some of it was chippy. Some of it looked almost like sand, you know? And so it's, uh, there's enough fractures that water can migrate through it quite a bit. Matter of fact, Howard told a story about the way these lakes were formed when they were mining the lime, they got to a certain point where they had to pump water out every day. And then it got to the point where they had to pump it out continually with a six inch diesel pump. Then it got to the point where a six inch pump couldn't keep up with it. So they set another one up, set it up, kept digging and then hit a fracture and water gushed in there and they didn't have time to get one of the pumps out. So if y'all want to come salvage a pump that's been underwater for how long? 10 or 15 years? No, longer than that. No. 50 years. 50 years. There's yeah. a 50 year old diesel pump right out here behind us, somewhere in 20 feet of water. So, right where there's good crappies, usually. You catch but, crappie yeah. off the pump. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, so now we, we electrofish the house lake. And what did we find there? What, was, what stood out in your mind about the house lake? 
I could hardly see for all the tears from the first two legs. <laughs> <laughs> what stood out? <coughs> Shiners, uh, but less less brim. So the bluegill numbers were depleted. And now these are copper nose bluegill and Florida bass. We're south of Suwannee River. So the state of Florida is real particular about what they allow to be introduced in these lakes. They won't allow bass to be brought in from outside. So they're trying to keep the genetic integrity of these strains that fish through here. And so uh, one of the observations that I made today, and Robbie made it too, is that these lakes are pretty heavily dependent on golden shiners for food. Now with the amount of vegetation, it's perfect spawning substrate for golden shiners. And here's the data sheet on that lake today. So let's kind of talk about that a little bit. 15 and a half inch largemouth bass, 1.68. A 14 and a half, 1.57. 11 and a half, 0.56. 18 inch bass, 2.95. <clears throat> An 18 inch bass should weigh three and a quarter. Uh, here's a 16, 2.02, should weigh two and a quarter. So what we, what we figured out that these bass mostly roam. They roam throughout the whole lake chasing food. And since they're chasing shiners, listen to this. <laughs> Golden shiners. Robbie held one up that's 12 and a quarter inches long. I've never seen a shiner that big. The biggest shiner I had ever seen up to today was a little over eight inches. We measured it at 12 and a quarter. I took pictures of that. I'll put them on the Facebook page later. And then he picked one up 13 inches long. He's ready to go all through that photo process again. <clears throat> so after it was over, they picked up one, two, three, four, four shiners over 10 inches long. And then multitudes that are, you know, four and a half to five inches, six inches. And then you saw several big schools of shiners that were evading the electric fishing boat that you guys didn't pick up. Right. So golden shiners are a dominant food source here in the panhandle of Florida. So uh, we're gonna take that into consideration as we come up with a plan to make things better. So then we went over to the uh, tree, tree lake. lake and then tell me what you saw there. Uh, more bass, bigger bass, mm -hmm. even fewer bluegill. What about the shiners? Some, and uh, because of the vegetation in there, they were just harder to pick now, up. Now that lake, that. that lake had not been treated with veg for vegetation. It was full of cara and bushy pondweed interspersed in there. <coughs> so, 19 inch bass, 3.78. 21 inch bass, four and a half. 23 and a half bass, 6.5. 22 inches, 5.8. 16 inch bass, 1.83, 18 inch bass, 2.84. So these, and there was more of them beyond that, uh, but um, the bass were just hovering just to the left of the relative weight curve. And it, they're a little underweight, but they're not underweight because of inadequate food sources, I don't believe. I think they're underweight because they have to chase their food. So, and, and they're kind of, they're reaching a, kind of an equilibrium based on the habitat. Now, how many times have you heard me say, as go the habitat, so goes what lives in it? And that's a perfect example out here. So this is great habitat for bait fish to hide, get away in the vegetation in the tree lake. <coughs> uh, you've, you've excised the, <laughs> the vegetation from the other lakes. So that's freed up a bunch of bait fish. So now with these changes, there's going to be a change in the fishery. And we saw that in one of the lakes where we saw extra recruitment of bass going on. So there's now there's bass coming up uh, from the freshman team to the JV headed toward the varsity and hoping we can push them up to NCAA or NFL standards. So we're going to be talking about some remedial stocking, ways to make the lake more productive, productive in the sense that it can grow more fish. With water clarity as, as it is here, where you can see anywhere from seven to 20 feet deep. You know, there were several times I was watching, I didn't go out in the boat, I watched these guys, it was pretty fun. There were several bass <coughs> that had to be substantial that you couldn't reach because they looked like they might be five feet deep, but they're 10 feet down. Yeah. So they'd get shocked at six or seven, eight feet, and then they'd sink and they couldn't reach them. So, uh, uh, 
part of the plan now is to monitor water temperatures over the winter, see where the temperatures bottom out, and then as the temperatures begin to go up in the spring, ramp up a feeding program for at least one of the lakes, um, look at the fertility levels and measure visibility. And if the visibility changes, we want to monitor that. And if it doesn't, we want to fertilize here and see if we can't get a plankton bloom going. And so the, there's going to be some remedial stocking of gizzards. And I mean, uh, we want to look at threadfin shad, golden shiners, and probably some bluegill when the timing is right after we can start to get some plankton growing into the water. And then see how the bass respond to that. See if, and um, make a few habitat changes here and there. Like more places for bluegill to spawn, especially. So we're going to talk about that. Troy Todd's giving us a big round of applause. Giving somebody a big round of applause. Okay, Ben Kasturin says, Can you use catfish as a predator fish instead of largemouth bass in a bluegill pond trying to grow big bluegill? <coughs> um, not really. Now, the channel catfish are top end predators. And here's where it gets a little tricky. A channel catfish, if you're, especially if you feed them, they get to be two and a half, three pounds, and then they'll skyrocket to seven or eight pounds. And then you lose control of how many bluegill they eat. So with largemouth bass, you can keep them stunted. You, know, you can keep them from 11 to 14 inches long by using males or just by culling. Where channel catfish, it's a lot harder to cull because they won't bite a hook as easily. You know, and they're not quite as predictable. So uh, now, if you want to, if you want to use, if you want to use channel catfish or use catfish as a predator, you can. You just have to be more attentive to it. But bass work better for that. Jeff Thompson from North Carolina says, uh, read the article in the last magazine. How about rope known in the wintertime in a one acre pond looking to start over a small pond? Absolutely, yes. <clears throat> now, the caveat with the rope known is you got to get it mixed into the water really, really well. So it's got to be, if, if you got 10 feet of water, you got to get that rope known down in 10 feet. You know, and you got to use it at the recommended rate. I'd recommend using it a little bit higher. That's one gallon per acre foot. So I'd bump that up to 1.1 or 1.2 gallons per acre foot and have a way to disperse it throughout the entire water column. And it'll take longer for the fish to die, and it will take longer for the water, the rope known to dissipate from the water where you can restock it. But if you do it in the winter, you're not worried about restocking it until the spring. So the answer to that is yes, you can. Um, Wyatt's asking, I know it's early, but want to be ready when the time is right. What's the best temperature and time to start fertilizing? <clears throat> well, the best temperature is about 58 to 60 degrees when the water temperature is rising in the spring. Now, what we talked about is Howard's going to check his water, tem water temperature and his visibility two or three times a week and kind of set, a, get a pattern and see what that pattern is and see if it changes. You know, because you'll get some bluebird days here where the water temperature will rise eight or 10 degrees. And if your visibility decreases by six or seven feet, that's going to be something that's going to tell us something. It's going to tell us that there's a bloom starting on its own. Then the temperature goes back down. It goes, up, goes away. <coughs> so, the uh, bottom line is the best temperature is 58 to 60 degrees going up. And uh, why, where you are in Abilene, that's going to be late April. Here in Florida, it's probably going to be late February. In Iowa, don't do it. Don't fertilize in Iowa. Don't fertilize in Illinois, you know, unless we have a conversation. So uh, here we go. It's 7.04. I'm going to take a minute and do a little commercial. Because I do want to thank Karina Mills for helping sponsor this show. You know, Howard is... It's telling me today that if he had something to advertise, he'd want me to talk about it <laughs> because of the way I talk about Purina. <clears throat> so I do appreciate Purina because of the way that they have addressed our industry to create better products for you and I. And I totally believe in their products. And I, I have seen those products, and I've used them and grown some big, big fish, big bluegills especially. You know, those bluegill can be huge, you know, over... Where Jeff Thompson is, you can grow some two and a half pound bluegills. I think you can do that here. I think you can do that here with Aquamax MVP. Texas Hunter Feeders, uh, golly, they've got the best products out there and the best customer service. And Chris Blood, every time I think about Texas Hunter, Chris Blood always tells me to promote myself. I'm not comfortable doing that. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you this. 
The Institute of Higher Pondology, 495 bucks for all six modules. We added four new videos today. Uh, one of them was Electrofishing Lake Deanna. Another one was uh, working on the Purina Mills Lake. Another one was with John Red about aeration. And the other one was, um, oh, it was Electrofishing Angry Beaver Ranch in Missouri. And all of those, all four of those videos, I think two of them went into the uh, fisheries management module, one went into the happy water module, and the other one went into making a pond plan. The Purina one went into planning for a perfect, perfect pond. So you guys that are already in the Institute, they're there for you for free. Everybody else, write a check. We'd love for you to. I said that kind of comfortably. <laughs> <laughs> so as we, as we talked about, Let's see, Billy Bates, I knew it was that time. I was just promoting, oh, you know what, that's great. There's Robbie Shell. Rob used to work for uh, Purina Mills not too long ago. Billy Bates, thank you very much. How about them Texas Hunter feeders loaded up with Aquamax? Is that a good combo? Yeah, baby, it is. <laughs> Billy, good job, buddy. Let's see here. Um, Mark Durham, hi, Bob, hope all is well. Question, what's the difference between golden roaches and golden shiners? Well, I've never seen a golden roach, but I've seen a lot of roaches, and they're the same thing as ruds. They're native to Europe, Great Britain to be exact, and they were introduced in the United States probably 25 years ago as bait. Well, once they started to escape into some of the rivers and streams, they biologists figured out they were invasive and displacing native species of minnows. I've seen more roaches and ruds in, in the Carolinas than anywhere else in the nation. And these here are golden shiners. Now, I've never, I've never seen a golden roach, but every roach I've ever seen has got red fins. Every one of them, red fins, red tail. Hmm. And they're, they're as big as these golden shiners were today. And, you know, and I may be wrong. I, may, I could be dead wrong. I've never heard of a golden roach. I've never seen one. But I'm telling you, these had all the markings of golden shiners. And they look just like golden shiners, except bigger. And you know what? I, I can see... One of, the one of the things I'm accepting is where they are because they've got the perfect habitat. <clears throat> they've got everything they need to grow large. They've got the habitat to reproduce. They can graze, which is that's what they do. A shiner, believe it or not, it's a predator fish, limited by mouse size. They're notorious nest raiders. You know? And so uh, as we go forward with this project, we're going to keep those kind of things in mind. You know, and I, and I do see how these lakes have been dependent on shiners. Another thing about the roaches, every minnow we saw had golden tails and fins for whether they were three inches long, eight inches long, or 13 inches long. So I'm pretty confident. I'm going to look that up, though, because I'm, I'm, when you ask me a question like that, I really want to go check that out. So now... You know, at, at, here we are. We had expectations. We didn't meet them. Now we know the reality. We've come off of that a little bit. And now, after you start digesting all this, the reality is, is you need to go to the basics, figure out how to make the lakes produce more fish, and then mold the fishery to where it can benefit the game fish. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Yeah. So when you see that, uh, give the folks a little bit of your thought process going forward now? Well, we're clear on <coughs> the small uh, bass hole. The, we'll have to be renamed brim hole. It won't be bass hole. Yeah. We're, gonna, we're gonna focus on brim there. Okay. I think that's that's a good plan. And don't worry, you can get credit for that. You can- you Get credit for renaming it? Yeah, no, for, <laughs> for deciding to go on bluegills instead oh, of bass. Oh, well, you know, it was your, your idea. <laughs> well. I, I, I endorse it wholeheartedly. Yeah. And as far as the others, I mean, these lakes have always looked crystal clear. I showed you, they test the same as my well water. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they're all, it's connected through the aquifer and this well. But we're going to work hard on uh, the fertility and getting visibility down. And I've never, I haven't seen that. I've only been here two years watching these, but I've never seen them anything but crystal clear. So okay. I realize now that that's a big deal to... Uh, production mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and one of the one of the tricks here is going to be to not feed the plants so you've got the stage set pretty well by, by taking out a bunch of the plants and one of the keys to success here i think is going to be 
watching how the plants, uh, like Dave Weber was asking, why didn't you have a fish kill? Well, these, all these plants are decomposing as we speak. <clears throat> they have not released their nutrients yet, but they will and won't take long, much longer. And when they do, those nutrients are going to add fertility to the water. So that's why I'm saying let's watch the temperature and see if the visibility changes. Because if we get into February and the water temperature is going up here in Florida, then and we start to see a plankton bloom, the visibility is decreasing, we might say we don't need to fertilize because the dead plants are doing it for you. Yeah. So we'll see. Okay, Billy Miller, like Dr. Dittrick, also used fluoridone this year, active ingredient in wipeout. And it truly is amazing. And the way, and the way that flur, fluoridone works is, uh, I think I said it was a contact killer. It is, but it, it's, it's more of an enzyme. The way it works is the plant absorbs it, then it stops its ability to photosynthesize. So in, in essence, it, it causes the plants to, uh, to starve themselves to death. You know, and then those plants, that's what they did. And that was another big reason. The, the drift of the fluoridone going all over the lake allowed it to do what it does to slowly kill the plants. It has to be slow because it's, it's working on their metabolic ability. That's right. That's right. It's totally disrupting their metabolism. And it better work given its price, too, let me tell you. $1,800 a gallon or something ridiculous? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, Billy says, I also used fluoride on this year, active ingredient wipeout, and it truly is amazing in how it cleaned up my four and a half acre pond. However, I'm just treating the symptoms, not the problem, which is too much nutrient load. What do you believe is the best method of nutrient sequestering? <clears throat> That's a pretty cool question. There are, um, I think that is evolving as we speak. Now, I do think that... Um, can't think of the product name now, um, but it is it is a uh, it's a polymer with and some of you guys are gonna know the name, but it's escaping me. But it uses um, aluminum sulfate to sequester phosphorus, so you can do it chemically. Another way you can do it is. If you can convert those nutrients into plankton, then you can convert the plankton into insects. You can convert the insects into small fish, convert the small fish into bigger fish. So the bottom line is you can end up taking a lot of those nutrients and turn them into flesh. Now in Texas where we know they're gonna die, we do that with tilapia. Now I wouldn't put tilapia here, it's too far south. Now, I don't know whether they're legal here or not. Foslock, that's it. Billy, you got it, Foslock. P-H-O-S lock, FOS lock, look that up. Um, but, so there's ways to chemically sequester it, but there's also, and I like the ways that we try to do where we can convert all this nutrient load to flesh. Now, the other thing is flushing. You know, if you can get the, get the um, plants manageable, you get a rainfall and you flush some of that water out with a good plankton bloom in it, you're also sending nutrients downstream. You know, to other people that might need them, might not, you know? So uh, that's really the three ways. If you can convert them to flesh, I think that's the best. Sounds easy, not easy. You know, you can use Foslock. What that does is sequesters the, the phosphorus, makes it precipitate down to the bottom and just hang out in the mud where it can't be regurgitated up and be used again. So that's one of the ways it works. Fos clear, yeah, that's another one, Danny Max. See, these guys come to my rescue every time I need it. <laughs> okay, well, it's almost 7.15. Hey, be sure, be sure to click like, share this to your timeline, uh, tag some of your friends. You know, folks that you know that own ponds and lakes that could benefit from this information. Let's get them involved as well. And if you'll do all that, hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comments section. Palm Boss Magazine, 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date. <laughs> Then you're eligible for a Palm Boss hat and a Palm Boss mug. I'll probably even throw in a uh, throw in a, a, a fish poster. I've got a sunfish poster that we can't sell. <laughs> well, I thought it would sell, but it doesn't. You want a Palm Boss hat? Sure. There you go. He won. He got Howard got the drawing tonight. <laughs>
Brand new palm balls to that. So uh, let's 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 keep talking a little bit about what we did today. What were some of your take home points that we haven't really talked about yet that these guys gals can can benefit from? Well, again, I, for me, the biggest is water clarity is not always good. Or, I mean, that's just the bottom line. That was the biggest thing for me, and. Uh, I was, I didn't understand the proportion, especially of bluegills mm -hmm. that were in some of these places. And I certainly didn't realize that all these bass are that dependent on shiners. In these, in these lakes, they are dependent on yeah. shiners. So if we can ramp up bluegill production, get some threadfin shad started, because I think they can overwinter here. Because this is, Danny Mac, we're on the same latitude as you are in San Antonio. You know, which we're on the same latitude as about Houston going west towards San Antonio. So threadfin shad ought to make it through the winter here every year. So they would be a real good addition. I wouldn't put gizzard shad in here because gizzard shad love shallow, muddy water. And the last thing we want is for gizzard shad to come in here and overpopulate because there's not enough big bass to keep their numbers down. Mm. So we want to avoid that. So I would not recommend gizzard shad here. Danny Mac says it includes the pH buffer, the Alka-Seltzer, which that's one thing you gotta be careful about with alum. <clears throat> if you put too much alum in there, you're gonna send your pH into acid hell and cause some real problems with fish. Okay. Ben is asking another question. One more question for now. I live in central Illinois, 50 plus year old pond, half acre in size, maximum depth nine feet, foot and a half of silt at the bottom. Is there a minimum depth, depth for a pond to stop producing big bluegill? A minimum depth for a pond to stop producing bluegill. No, there's not a minimum depth for it to stop producing bluegill. There's a there's a minimum depth that gives the advantage to predators. I mean, you can grow bluegill in two feet of water, but a heron can wade in 30 inches of water. So it kind of defeats the purpose. You know, now the, um, the main point is, is nine feet of water with a foot and a half of silt is not gonna keep you from growing big bluegills. You can do that in a half acre pond. What you need to do is you need to be prepared to call the reproduction, and that's why we're using bass here. You know, that's why the catfish question was asked earlier. Um, but <clears throat> I still would encourage you to have enough areas for bluegill to spawn so you have good recruitment because you don't, they only live six to eight years typically in the northern states, maybe longer, southern states may be shorter. But if you can make sure they have enough feed, they can make it to six to eight years and there's a JV coming up the pipe, then you're going to be more likely to have a, a good sustainable crop of bluegill and feed them MVP or feed them 500, Aquamax 500, little bitty pellets. So that would be a good way to go. Yeah, Danny Mac says, except for last February. Yeah, well, did you guys get that Arctic blast here last February? Mm -hmm. You did? Mm -hmm. how, how did it, what did it do here? I didn't really notice anything. Of course, I was recovering from Oh, yeah, you'd had, an ag you'd had a wreck. You were, uh, yeah. you were on another planet, so to yeah. speak. All right, so um, I guess some, oh, I did go get to go work on a lake on Monday in East Texas where... This gentleman had bought the property for his family, and he's probably in his mid-40s, and it's got about a 15, 18-acre lake on it. And that's one of the best lakes I've seen in a while. He had a range of sizes of bass. He had eight different size classes of bass. His water was fertile green. There were threadfin shad and gizzard shad everywhere, and they ranged in size. The threadfins were from there to there, Gizzard shad from here to here to here to a few big ones. But he had enough large, largemouth bass to keep the gizzard shad numbers in check. Eight sizes of bluegill. <coughs> and so that lake was in pretty good shape because the, the man that he bought it from built the lake 20 years ago and has managed it, learned the lake. He's 85 now, decided he wanted to sell it. He wanted to sell it to somebody that would take care of it. And this guy had us come look at it so he could make sure he's taking care of it. But that lake has been managed and, and now it's mature. And uh, he had all the elements. He was a little bit short on habitat, 
fish structure, especially for small bait fish, but there's a, quite a bit of shallow water and the water's fertile. So we didn't see any kind of an aquatic plant problem like we did here. You know, of course it's a totally different climate and a totally different set of circumstances. So I guess the main point is, is your fishery is gonna respond to that environment with that water, with that chemistry, with that habitat. So the fish are more or less a consequence of what you've got out there. So what we did here was to see what's, what are the stimulators, what is the behavior, and what do these lakes have to offer, and then what needs to happen to change that to get the end result. And that's where we went today. So now we got to figure out how to make the lakes more productive, minimize the aquatic plants, maximize the plankton, bolster the food chain with stocking some species, managing gold. I, I'm going to believe in golden shiners here because they're working. They're working really well here. More bluegills, threadfin shad to fill an open niche after there's fertility in the water. If we put threadfin shad in here now, they'd starve to death and probably get eaten. Oh, 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 they've got another little, another little issue to pay attention to. Alligators. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so he's got a few alligators to watch for over here. Although I, I can't, can't see any evidence where they've been disruptive to the fishery. So that kind of sums it up for me. you have any other uh, thoughts to take with you? No. Um, it, what an experience. I would recommend doing something like this to get an insight into, into what you have going on. It's a little different than catching fish. Uh, yeah, and especially integrating the fish with the rest of the habitat and understanding. Well, I've, we've heard you lecture enough about that, so we're putting it to, to real So here work it goes. Now. It's going to work. Yeah. All right, well, you know what? I'm going to wrap it up here, and we've been almost an hour, 52 minutes, and uh, we've hit some pretty good topics, and my throat's about to give up. So I'm not sure where I'll be next Wednesday, yeah, I do. I'm going to be in my office. I've got some Oklahoma Lakes projects that are being worked on there, and I need to go take a look at them. Uh-oh, here comes something else. <clears throat> Danny says, do you have a small electrofishing boat? Well, this boat was not as big as the one that you've been in, Danny Mac, but I don't know if it's small, small enough to go get in your lake. You really need a backpack for your stream and pond. You need a backpack electrofishing unit. Billy Miller gonna be clearing and leveling an acre of ground for a wedding venue that's only 150 feet from the top of my pond. Any recommendations to mitigate any damage to flowing into the pond? Vegetate that disturbed earth as fast as possible. Set up some silt fences. Don't let any dirt flow with rainfall. Don't, don't allow that to happen. So that's the way I would do it. John Pearson, good to see you. So we're gonna cut out and thanks again for joining me. Be sure to check out pondboss.teachable. Dot com. That's the Institute of Higher Pondology. Uh, the new book is finished. We got to do a little bit more layout and tweak a few things, then we'll be ready to go to the printer. I still don't know how much it's going to cost because I haven't gotten it pinned down with what it's going to cost to lay it out and what the print bill is going to be, but it's going to be probably around $20 to $25 is what it looks like. So I don't know yet, but when I know, I'll let you know. So uh, until then, I really appreciate you watching and Dr. Dittrich, thanks for hanging out. Thank you. And we had a big time today. It was great. So until next Wednesday, everybody, adios.